Father in heaven, again, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We're praying that distractions can be muted and that we can focus and understand thy truth for this time. We ask that you would speak to our hearts. Truly, you have, you have said to the children of Israel then and to the church of Paul's time, and you're saying to us today that we will not harden our hearts as in the provocation, the tempting of the wilderness. Lord, help us to understand those lessons and knowing that those things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this night. And draw us closer to thee is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, uh, we want to turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the third chapter, the book of Hebrews. We have gone through uh, chapters one and two. And again, you could go to our uh, EG Bible School channel on YouTube and you can go to our playlist videos and you can see where we uh, began uh, or have begun a series of studies dealing with the book of Hebrews. Um, and we are in chapter three tonight. And one thing that you're going to notice as we look through the book of Hebrews, as we look at these practical lessons on the life of God's people, as they have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, as they have been called from that region beyond, as Abraham was called out of Babylon, so God has called his people in these last days to depart from the principles and the sins of Babylon that God tells us in the last days, Revelation 18, that in these days that God says to come out of her, that we be not partakers of her sins and that we receive not of her plagues. And so here Paul is speaking specifically, literally to the Christian brethren. He is speaking to the believers of his time. And yet he uses a familiar tone when he says Hebrew. He's taking them back to their foundation. He's taking them back when God separated them and called them to be a great and mighty people. And so when we keep in mind, as we study this in uh, the book of First Corinthians, as a matter of fact, hold your finger here, we'll come back. The Bible tells us in first Corinthians, I was thinking of Romans four, but we'll bypass that for, for the sake of time. But notice what it says in first Corinthians, the 10th chapter, first Corinthians chapter 10. And here he's speaking concerning God's people specifically in the wilderness. But this principle that Paul is going to cite in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 and 11, actually can apply to God's people from when he separated them in Babylon, when he called Abraham to separate, not only from the Babylonians, but he had called him, as it says in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, he had called him away from his kindred. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to verse 3. Uh, Stephen makes reference to this in Acts chapter 7. God had to call Abraham not only out of the world, but he had to separate him from his kindred who had begun to do what? Bow down to graven images. They had begun to accept the philosophies and the false teachings of the environments around them. They had begun to, as it were, to uh, begin to uh, uh, integrate, to, to find a commonality between the works of darkness. They tried to blend the things of the world and the philosophies and the teachings of of the world with the principles of God. And God said to Abraham that he had to not only come out of Babylon, but he would have to separate from his kindred who would not uh, separate from those abominable works. Yes, they, many of his kindred, Terah, uh, 
as it were, his brother as it were, they came out of Babylon with him, but they would not separate from their sins. They left Babylon, but they did not, they were, as God says about the children of Israel leaving Egypt, they were not estranged, they were not divorced from their lust, from that lifestyle. And so as leaving Babylon, they still clung to many of the idolatries. And God had said further to Abraham, get out, not from Babylon, you've left Babylon, but separate from your kindred. Separate from them because they will not, they will not separate from the principles of sin separate from them. And God called Abraham as it were one from beyond the waters, just as God calls us in a practical way through baptism, through conversion to separate from a life of sin, not to go, but he, he calls us to come out of the world and to embrace these principles. And so the flood for you and I is not the Red Sea. The flood for you and I is not, is not the river Euphrates, the Tigris river there, uh, 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 very associated with Babylon. But for us, our river is baptism. Our river is being born again not of this world of corruptible seed, but of that incorruptible seed, the word of God. So the river for you and I is conversion. The river for you and I is repentance, being baptized with the spirit. That is the river that God is looking to bring us through so that we can be prepared to follow the instructions that God has laid out for us. God told Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see, understand, appreciate the principles of heaven. And brothers and sisters, it's not until we are converted. It, was, it would be one thing if Christ was talking to a man that was a Gentile or Samaritan, but he was talking to a leader, a master, a man that held, was held in high esteem, a man that held degrees in theology, a man who was a professor and teacher in Israel, and God had to look at him and say, except a man be born again, he cannot understand the principles of heaven. He will always seek to make some compromise with sin and with Satan. And so for you and I, the river, is conversion, baptism, repentance. This is what will make us a Hebrew. Notice you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse, I'll start in verse 5, verse 5 and verse 6, and then we'll read verse 11. Notice what it says. It says, but with many that God brought out, but with many of them, God was not what? Well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent. We should not want lust, desire after evil things as they also lusted. And then he says in verse 11, now all these things, now all these things happened unto them for in samples or types, they are for us and they are written for what? Our admonition upon whom the what? Ends of the world are come. And so brothers and sisters, that what we find being written in the word of God, what we, be, what we find that was spoken in person and that they went through, it was not written for them, but for us. What we find in the word of God applies more for us than those who wrote it. God wrote it for us with the intent that we would not fall and walk after the things that they also 
fell and lusted after. So now here we are in the book of Hebrews. Now here we are in the book of Hebrews and we find Paul moved upon by the Spirit of God and he is in a very elementary way taking God's people back to the beginning and he's showing them and he's showing them how Christ is greater than everything that they have held to or that they have esteemed or saw or saw light in. In comparison to Christ, it pales in glory. He shows us in the beginning in chapter one and chapter two, he shows us Christ as the son of God, one who would become in the that would take the place of Adam. We studied and saw how Adam was referred to in the book of Luke chapter three and verse 38, how Adam was the son of God, how Adam fell because of transgression and God became as it were the second Adam. He took up the place where man fell from. Jesus, the Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verses five, all the way down, you can read down to verse 10, but Philippians 2, verse 5, where Christ says, let this mind, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, watch this, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a man. Jesus became Man, God became man, not a God. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, and the Word was, and the Word is God. This is what he's showing us. The same was in the beginning. He's not saying that the Word Christ is a God, but he is God. Jesus says, I and my father are one. And why did they want to stone him? Because Jesus made himself like a God? No, they said, you committed blasphemy. What blasphemy? They said, because thou being a man, watch this, makest thyself God, John 10, verse 30 to verse 33. It says, in Mark chapter two, verses five to seven, when Jesus told the paralytic that thy sins be forgiven thee, the Pharisees, we are told, murmured within themselves. And they said, why doth this man commit what? Blasphemy. Who can forgive sin but God only? They recognize that Jesus was referring to himself as God. In the book of John chapter eight, when Jesus says that he was before Abraham and they looked at him and they said, wait a minute. No, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. And they looked back and they said, what? Thou art not yet 50 years old. How be it that thou could say that Abraham saw your day. And Jesus says before Abraham, watch this, was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. Why? Because Jesus referred to himself as Jehovah. Jehovah, Exodus chapter three, I am that I am. And so we find that, wait a minute, how could Jesus be a son and yet be God. Adam, Adam was the son of God. Jesus would take the place where Adam fell. And now not Adam, but Jesus stands at the head of the race as man and yet God. And so brothers and sisters, we realize that Jesus is the begotten, the only begotten from what? The dead not birth, but from the dead. And so Jesus is begotten, Colossians 1, as it talks from verse 13, 
I believe it's uh, maybe even verse 12 down to verse 18, where Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. Not the firstborn in the sense of creation, far as everything that God has created, but he is the firstborn of every creature. Why? Because Adam was the firstborn of all of God's creation. Speaking of humanity, Jesus took the place from whence Adam fell. Thus he bears the title Son of God. Thus he bears firstborn from the dead. Why? Because he had to pay man's sin. The penalty of man's sins. What was his sin? Death. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the firstborn from the dead. It is because of his death that you and I might have life. And so in the book of Hebrews, Paul is showing us that though Adam, as we look at Adam as being great, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And so we find here in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, we are going to find that it is going to speak of Moses. However, Moses or Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses was given the task of bringing God's people from Egypt to the promised land. Jesus, greater than Moses, has been given the task of bringing his people from sin to holiness. So just as God used Moses to bring his people to the promised land, so Jesus, greater than Moses, brings us from sin to heaven, from earth to heaven. And so we find that in the ministry of Jesus, he's greater than that of Moses. The people esteemed Moses as a great one. But here Paul says, Moses was great, but Jesus is greater. Notice what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter three, Hebrews chapter three, brothers and sisters, God will speak to us as we read his word. You know, I've studied this book before I've, I've studied it. I've presented it before. And when I got to chapter three and chapter four, I would began to see, and there were certain things that I didn't understand. I was studying it last night. And as I was reading through chapter three, and through chapter four, I'm still was somewhat perplexed in my mind as to what is this? What is this rest? Why I understand that Jesus is greater than Moses, but what was the, the why is Paul citing this as a example for us in these last days? And I said, wow. And I began to see it, but brothers and sisters, you know that just right now, I finally saw the connection. At this very moment, I see now why Jesus is greater than Moses. Brothers and sisters, the Bible, the Holy Spirit will open our understanding. He will teach us as we endeavor to share the truth with others. God will make truth more clearer to us. Notice what it says. We are here in the book of Hebrews chapter three. Thank you, Lord. Chapter three, Hebrews chapter three and verse one, the Bible says, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, watch this, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, Jesus. One more time. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus, an apostle? Why would Paul refer to Jesus as an apostle? Notice what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 
verse 1 down to verse 10. Brothers and sisters, this book of Hebrews is a lesson for the people of God in these last days. If we understand the book of Hebrews and the context in which it was given, we will see how it applies to us where we stand prophetically in the procession of ages. As we see the nations aligning themselves to operate with that power of Revelation chapter 17, that woman who was that beast who received that deadly wound, that woman in Revelation 17 who's riding the nations of the earth and how those nations are going to give over their strength and power to this beast. They are going to be governed by that woman, that whore of Revelation 17. And the Bible says that they are going to reign with her for a short space, for the, for a set time. They are going to reign with her. They are going to make war with the people of God. And so as we understand prophetically where we are in the procession of ages, we will understand that when Paul was writing this book to the people of, of uh, to the Christian church, as he did not see, I believe, that this book, these letters, God would gather together and would bring them down to the last days and would show how Christ's priestly ministry as it closes in heaven. So probation upon the people of God would be closing just as probation upon God's people was soon to close in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. Paul was a prisoner around the time while he's writing this. He was soon in a few years, in a few months to have his head chopped off by Nero. Jerusalem was about to be destroyed. That city that was beloved of the Jews, that God had forsaken. God had allowed his spirit to be manifested in those individuals who had, who had by repentance drawn themselves to Christ. But as the cathedrals and the synagogues continue to operate and confuse the people, God was about to allow the nations, the governments to come in and bring down that city and those who would still cling to its false worship would be lost. And so brothers and sisters, just as Paul was writing before the destruction of Jerusalem, how God was appealing to his people to abandon false worship, to not allow themselves to be taken by these false prophets to believe that God had put, that God had invested so much in a building that he invested so much in a denomination that God could not revoke or foreclose on his church that, and they were deceived brothers and sisters and God was appealing to them. And just like in the book of Hebrews, Paul starts with Adam and then he moves to Moses and then he moves to the services and then he moves to the ministry and then he moves to the sanctuary and he's continually showing them that everything that they had confidence in that made them this great people that Jesus was greater. And here we are in these last days and we're clinging to the almost identical things that those Jews were clinging to then, but not understanding that if we would study the word of God, we would see that everything that God has given to us is greater than that which we have put so much stake in. We have put so much confidence in this things. In one minute we say that that worship and church attendance is voluntary. And then yet we preach that if people do not attend our places of worship, they're going to be lost. We're professing to be Protestants, but in principle and practice, brothers and sisters, we are more Catholic than Catholics. Why? Because we are deceived. We are deceived. But oh, brothers and sisters, God, like Paul, if we would see that bright light, if we would understand who Christ really is, then God will cause the scales to fall from our eyes. So here the Bible calls 
Paul calls Jesus an apostle. Was Jesus an apostle? Well, let's look at what an apostle is. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. You should be there. 1 Corinthians 15, and we're looking at verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also, by which also ye are saved, if ye what? Keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, watch this, that which I also received. Now, wait a minute. Hold your finger there. Go in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 1. We're coming back. Now, notice Paul said, I've delivered that to you, which was delivered unto me. Notice what it says. Galatians, chapter 1, verse 11, 12, and 13. Notice what it says. The Bible says in Galatians 1, verse 12 to verse 13. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation lifestyle in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and he wasted it. Now notice what he says. I certify you, brethren, almost as though uh, 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 he is giving his, he's putting a stamp upon it. He is, is being certified. And he says that what I preached unto you, he says, this was not after man. He says, it was, what did he say? He says, it was not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we would go back to 1 Corinthians 15. And he says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How did he receive it? Through revelation. He said, then come after man. That which he learned, pardon me, that which he learned from Gamaliel, that's not what he was giving to the people. He wasn't giving them the teachings of Gamaliel. He learned the traditions of the Jews' religion. He learned those things that they held in high esteem. It wasn't the word of God that he... So learned. what Paul learned from Gamaliel, as we were saying, this is not what he gave to them. Paul talks about how he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. The things he learned from Gamaliel was the traditions of the fathers. He learned about the things that the church taught. He didn't learn the principles and truths of the word of God. This is why he could not withstand the wisdom that God had given to Stephen. And yet he was dumbfounded that he could not, he could not twist Stephen's words. Why? because the Holy Ghost had downloaded in Stephen's mind. Stephen was a student of the scriptures. And so Paul says, what I'm giving you, what I gave you, I is that which I received. And he's not talking about Gamaliel. He's not talking about the traditions of the fathers. What he is talking about is that which came as a revelation of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, when you study the word of God, when you and I study the Word of God, we are receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a revelation of truth. This is what Jesus gives to us. Matter of fact, I'll show you that. Hold your finger. Go, on to, go to Romans. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. You're going, we're going to come back here. I want you to notice uh, what the Scriptures says here. <laughs> In verse 25 and 26. 
Watch this. The revelation that you and I must receive, the same one Paul received and that he gives to us, is a revelation that comes from the scriptures. Watch this. Galatians, Romans, Romans 16, 25 and 26. He says, now to him, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according, watch this, to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Verse 26, but now is made manifest. And what? By the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So the revelation of truth that has been kept secret, God says in the book of, I believe it's Proverbs 3 and 25, that the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He says in Deuteronomy, the things which are revealed are for us and for our children. Revelation. It has been given to us, the truth, the revelation. God unlocks the truth for us. In the book of Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, when Daniel wanted to know the scriptures, God says, it is sealed, Daniel. It is shut up. The words are shut up until the end of time or the time of the end. But all that from Daniel chapter one, all the way to Daniel chapter nine was open revelation from chapter all the way to ch chapter, you know, uh, uh, nine, 10, 11, and 12 go together. But the truths that Daniel was, re that were revealed to him in Daniel chapter 11, God said, it's sealed, Daniel. You're not going to know this. You stand in your lot. It's going to be for those at the latter days. We find in Revelation chapter 10 that, that an angel is seen with that book open in his hand. Same way that it was sealed in Daniel chapter 12 is the same way that God unfolds it or opens it in Revelation 10. It is a revelation of truth. That which was sealed in Daniel, God has opened it for us in these last days. So Paul is telling us that the revelation that he received, God opened the scriptures to him. God allowed him to see in the scriptures the truth for this time. He allowed him to see from the word of God who Jesus was. And as he, as he immersed himself in the scriptures, the traditions that had been taught by the fathers where they were in, where they were in conflict with the word of God, he did not, did not lower the standard of truth to stay in harmony with his brethren, with his pastors, with his colleagues. He said, I count that but dung. And he exalted the word of God. Today you find people can read the Bible. They can read the testimonies of God's spirit. And they see that when they read the Bible and they, when they read the testimonies of God's spirit, it places them at odds with their colleagues. They are at odds with their conferences. They are at odds with many things that their brethren are promoting and teaching, but rather than standing by themselves, Jeremiah chapter 15, rather than standing alone, rather than sitting in the assemblies of the mockers, they lessen the force of God's word so as not to offend these false shepherds. Many of which, when you use the word many, but some of which might come and stand with them if they would just stand for the word of God, but they would rather be in harmony so as not to be persecuted by their church. And so for a place in the church, God is being sold out again. Jesus is being put on the cross as Caiaphas prophesied that he must die so that we can save the church. And so once again, truth is put on the cross so that they can stay in harmony with their brethren. So Paul, he said, hey, that which was given to me, revelation, I'm giving it to you. He gave them the word of God. What God shares with us, brothers and sisters, 
we must give to others. We must give them the revelation of truth. Notice, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember, brothers and sisters, our study tonight, harden not your hearts. Notice, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm in verse 3 again. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that what? Christ died for our sins according to what? The scriptures. So what was given to Paul? Revelation of Jesus Christ. He gave it to them. And he says, you know how Christ died according to the scriptures. He studied the word of God and he saw that Jesus was the truth. He saw that this was present truth. And he looked at his brethren who were teaching traditions. And he says, man, I, I can't walk in that. I can't do that anymore. Well, Paul, now, oh, mercy. You go and read Galatians. How Paul said he profited in the Jews' religion. In other words, when Paul was preaching the traditions of men, Paul was allowed to go from conference to conference. Paul could get invitations. He could go where he wanted to go. He, he got donations freely. And oh man, he just had a good old time. Had a, had a nice little website, uh, uh, had a ministry, got invites every now and then to, to go and, and be on this panel and to, to go be a part of this meeting. And, and he profited in the Jews' religion. They were able to donate to him they, he, he was able to get it all. He was able to have the best of both worlds when he profited in the Jews' religion. But when he learned truth, no longer was he allowed to preach in the churches. No longer was he allowed, uh, uh, could he get an endorsement to go from this conference to that conference. But oh, brothers and sisters, there were some who believed the truth and they opened their churches to Paul. They open their churches to him. Brothers and sisters, don't be, don't fail to understand that those, many of these individuals who had these synagogues, they no longer, uh, they no longer follow the traditions of their elders. They began to follow the gospel. So there were many synagogues that Paul preached in that were wholly given up to the truth of God for this time. Truly given up to the truth of God for this time. Notice, well, we're back here in 1 Corinthians 15. So it says uh, that Jesus, how that Christ, verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, which is Peter, then the twelve, verse six, after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the presence, but some are fallen to sleep, speaking of death, verse seven, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, watch this, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And so notice, brothers and sisters, Paul says, he's speaking of how he is an apostle. How was he an apostle? He was born of one out of due time. An apostle means one that has been called of God and that has been sent with a message. Was Paul sent with a message? Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter, Acts, the 26th chapter. 
Acts chapter 26. We read in Galatians how Paul was given a message. He was given the gospel to preach, but I want you to notice what it says in Acts 26. Acts the 26th chapter, looking at verse 18. I want you to notice what it says. Um, no, I'll start in verse, I'll start in verse 16. Verse 16 down to verse 18. Notice what Paul says. But rise, Paul was told, stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, the Jews, and from the Gentiles, unto whom I now send thee. Verse 18 to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. Here, Paul is called to be a minister. Paul was one, as he said, born of due time. God had given Paul a message to preach that came by revelation of truth. God pulled the scales, the scales fell from Paul's eyes and he studied the word of God as never before. And he received the message of present truth and being anointed by God, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, being converted, being born again, as it were, Baptized, it says in chapter nine of the book of Acts, when, when, when uh, Ananias came in unto him and he says, rise, Paul, be baptized, washing away thy sin. And the scales fell from his eyes. God sent him <clears throat> among the Gentiles. This is an apostle. Do we see the same experience in that of Jesus? Do we see Jesus? Not being, do we see Jesus being called from the carpenter's shop? Do we not see Jesus going through the watery baptism? Do we not see Jesus being filled with the Holy Ghost? Do we not see Jesus in Mark chapter one, write this down, Mark chapter one, verse 14, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he went forth to preach the gospel. Do we not see in Luke 4 and verse 18, Jesus <clears throat> opening the book of Isaiah, reading from Isaiah 61 and saying, the Lord, the spirit of the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and went forth healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus is called to be an apostle just as Moses was. Moses, brothers and sisters, yes, he was a prophet, but Moses was an apostle. Moses was raised up by God. Moses was one, as it were, that was born of due time. Moses was told by God, take thy hand, put it in thy bosom and he pulled it out and it was leprosy. And then he put it back in and he pulled it out and it was whole. Moses was converted. By death came man, but by man also came the resurrection. God was teaching Moses the experience of Jesus. Man sinned and brought damnation, but Jesus, the man, the son of God, would bring life and conversion and power. And this was, is what he was teaching Moses. He was teaching him the gospel of salvation, how man can be born again, how man who is in sin can be delivered by the man Christ Jesus, Paul says, who stands between us and man. There is only one mediator, we are told, between God and man. It is the man, Christ Jesus. And God gave Moses a message. Lord, what shall I say? Who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. Tell them I am have sent thee. 
Moses came with a message. What was the message? Let my people go was his message. And so Moses was one born of due time, sent by God into the belly of the beast to do what? To bring forth his people from darkness to light. Moses was an apostle. Moses was sent to deliver God's people. But like Moses was sent, brothers and sisters, as we said in the beginning, to bring God's people from Egypt to Canaan land, God has sent his son to bring us from earth to heaven. This is what? This is how Jesus is greater than that of Moses. So go back in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews chapter 3, brothers and sisters. Notice, brothers and sisters, these passages are important because God is building a case. God is hedging us in by great teachings and, and, and reasonings so that when we get to chapter 13, when God tells us, go without the gate, bearing his reproach, go to where Jesus is. Because we have followed God's reasoning, because by revelation we have allowed the truth to be open to us, we will recognize that, that here we have no continuing city. We have an altar, we have a sacrifice, but God is telling us to go forth. God is sending us out into the world. God is not calling us to be gatekeepers. God is not calling us to, 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 to legislate and, 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 to, and, and to get caught up in the wilderness and to eventually be overthrown. God is calling us into his rest. And we're going to find out that that rest in Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus says, not only has he given us to a rest, but God has commanded us that we ought to come before it. We ought to take it with boldness. We ought to come into his presence. Watch what he says. We're in Hebrews 3 now. God is building a case, brothers and sisters, and you have to study and understand because at every point, God has given us a commission. Don't go back. God has given us commission, but he says, hey, you got to be careful. You got to search your heart. Lest the sin of unbelief, lest that root of bitterness is in you and it spoils you. He's telling us, brothers and sisters, that we got to keep moving forward. We can't just be satisfied that we profess to know Jesus. We can't just be satisfied because we have the gospel. We have to continue to move forward and make sure that we are pressing to the throne of grace obtaining mercy to find help in our time of need. But like the early church, they got so, they, 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 they had gotten to the point where they got so comfortable just being Christians. They got comfortable, brothers and sisters, that God had at one time manifested his spirit among them, but they were not conscious of the fact that the spirit of God was no longer being manifested upon them but they were so caught up in talking about what happened in the past. They were, so taught, they were so caught up in preaching about the past. They were so fixated on what God had done at some point and some time by someone else other than by them. They talked about the conversion of others, but they could not talk about their own experience. They were able to talk about the mighty miracles that God had done through his disciples, but they could not talk about what God, what, what God was doing through them. And yet they did not see that they were void of the spirit of God and they did not have an experience. And for this reason, God has said that you have left your first love. God has said you have fallen. Yes, I know you're doing many wonderful works. Yes, I know that you're, 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 you're prospering in the Jews' religion. But God has said you are fallen, brothers and sisters. And Paul, God, through his minister, was from prison. God was writing and appealing to them from prison. God had to move upon his messenger in prison to write such such. Uh, 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 such stern and, 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 and glorious truth. And brothers, we are told in inspiration by a prophet that God suffered Paul to die. Why? Because the church, the church, brothers and sisters, 
no longer desired truth among them. They no longer labored and prayed anymore for the deliverance of God's people. And Paul, who ceaselessly worked among them, he worked uh, uh, unceasingly. He worked unceasingly to preach, to comfort, to build them up. But the church no longer appreciated it. The church had got comfortable in their, their legislation. They had got comfortable, brothers and sisters, in legislating things that the Spirit of God was not telling them to do. And there in the book of Acts chapter 21, it was the brethren's fault. It was James, the Lord's brother. It was the, it was the brother, not the Sanhedrin, not Annas and Caiaphas, but it was the brethren, it was those that professed present truth that actually came together and came up with a scheme and they came up with, with, a, with a, 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 a voted principle, a voted way of ministry. And then as a result of Paul coming together, placing confidence in his brethren and doing what the Spirit of God had not told him to do, Paul found himself for the rest of his ministry in jail. He was in prison following the counsel of the church. Spirit of God didn't tell Paul to do what he did in Acts 21, but the brethren did, the church did, and Paul came together <clears throat> and Paul reasoned in his mind and he followed the brethren and he ended up spending the rest of his ministry in prison traveling on boats, going to prison, being shipwrecked. Why? Because he listened to the brethren. And yet God in his infinite love allowed this to take place so that you and I would recognize no matter how much we love the brethren. Yes, we know that there is wisdom, that there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. But oh, brothers and sisters, we must make sure that we are stretching ourselves before Jesus, pleading with him, not despising counsel, but asking God to lead us like a shepherd, giving us strength to be obedient to that which he has asked us to do, brothers and sisters. And so God, uses Paul to give us this, 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 this weighty message so that we would understand that when God gets us to the end, why it is so crucial for us to move without the gate. Many are hesitant. Many are in a stupor. Many are not knowing what to do. Why? Because they won't go to the revelation. They won't allow the Spirit of God to move the scales from their eyes. And so they're just running around like a chicken with their head cut off, and they're trying to just be the latest trend in ministry. They don't want to do ministry after God's order. They simply want to be trending. They don't want to do ministry. They want to be the, the latest and greatest thing. They just want to be trendy and they have these, these trendy ministries and oh, brothers and sisters, but if we are going to find ourselves in a position where God can trust us, then we must allow the revelation to peel back the scales from our eyes. And God says here, Christ in Hebrews chapter three, he calls Christ an apostle. Jesus was sent, write the scripture down. John, oh, matter of fact, no, before you go there, look at, look at Hebrews three. And, and I'll read verse one again, and I intended to cover this whole chapter. Have mercy. Hebrews three, look at verse one. The Bible says, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Verse two, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse three, for this man, Jesus was counted more, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And as much as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. And then he says, 
for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now notice, here he's making a comparison between Christ and Moses. Moses was an apostle. We looked at that and we looked at the principle of how Moses was called by God, sent with a message. He is an apostle. When you look at Jesus, Jesus was sent with a message. Jesus says in John 14, 24, he says, hey, the words that I speak unto you, the commandments, the teachings, these sayings, they're not mine, but he that sent me. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. That what? Whosoever believeth in him, not just him as a person, but believeth his message. John 5, uh, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. Verse 46, he says, For if you don't believe my sayings, how, if you don't, John 5, I don't want to misquote this. Uh, John 5, 46, for had ye, there it is, for had you believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But, but if you believe not his writings, how, how shall you believe my words? Jesus was saying in John chapter 6, following that, that God was greater than that of Moses. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gave you that bread. Those in the wilderness ate manna, ate that bread, and they're dead. They're dead. <clears throat> but the bread that I give unto you, brothers and sisters, this bread is unto eternal life. He was speaking of his truth, his words, his body, his experience, his life. Receive it. It will bring forth life. And so just as Christ was an apostle, in all intents and purposes. So was Moses. But what did he say about Christ? That Jesus is more worthy, he says in Hebrews 3, that this man, Christ, was counted worthy of what? More glory than that of Moses. Moses, wow, he was glorious. Jesus, more glorious. Adam, praise God, was he received glory and honor, but Jesus, more glory, more honor than that of Adam. Moses, glory, honor, Jesus, more glory, more honor. And so as we study chapter 3, God is going to take us, chapter 3 and chapter 4, those two chapters go together. What he is doing is Paul is taking us back and he wants us to see how God, how Moses brought God's people out. And he wants to make the comparison that Jesus is trying to bring us out of what? Sin. But he's going to show us that the same thing that caused the overthrow of the children of Israel in the wilderness, he says, will cause the overthrow of God's people in these last days. Paul was talking to his holy brethren those who have been partakers of this heavenly calling. He was talking not to Annas and Caiaphas. He was not talking to those who were still prospering in the Jews. He was talking to those who, were, who had made a profession in the ministry of Jesus. And he's saying, you have to beware. You have to beware. Because you, as it were, have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if you are not careful, through the deceitfulness of sin, you are going to lose your inheritance so close to glory. So close. God allowed this man of God to see that the church was being derailed. And he had to let them know that you are in jeopardy of losing your inheritance while professing the name of Jesus. While professing Christ. We look and say, wow, look at what the conference, look at what they're legislating. And yet, brothers and sisters, look at what Caiaphas and Ananias, look at what they did to Jesus. Look at how they betrayed him. And brothers and sisters, it was the, the holy brethren 
that had got Paul in the predicament he was in. Like Jesus says in the book of Psalms, he says, if it was an enemy, I could have borne it. But it was one, one of my own equal who did this to me. And so we have to understand that we have to be careful that, that through the deceitfulness of sin, brothers and sisters, that our hearts are not being hardened. And we find ourselves being overthrown in this wilderness. Now, when we come back together, by God's grace, I want us to finish chapter three, I want us to go through it, and then I want us to get to chapter four. But for your homework, read chapter three and read chapter four. They go together. There are two chapters that go together. And I tell you, as Moses was called by God to bring his children from Egypt to Palestine, Jesus has been sent by God to bring us from earth to heaven. Are you going to allow yourself to be overthrown in this wilderness? Are you going to allow the lust and the desires that cause the overthrow of the people of God in the wilderness? Are you going to allow those same lusts to overthrow you? Are you going to provoke God to the point, to the point where God has to say enough? You will not see the promise. And brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, that word that declared that then, Paul says that word is still alive. That same word that declared, and brothers and sisters, oh, don't think, don't think that God is waiting. God is waiting for Congress to pass laws before God said enough is enough. Like that rich man, sitting there contemplating his finances. In Luke chapter 12, there were no religious legislation being passed. No one was arguing, debating about, no Sunday law. God said, thou fool, tonight your soul will be required of thee. Thou fool. Brothers and sisters, don't think, don't think that, that all of a sudden, some, something, Congress has to do something to signal us that was too late. You may be right now contemplating foolishness. You right now might, might be, you're, you might be putting yourself in a position where God will have to say to you, thou fool. Brothers and sisters, may God help us. May God help you and I not to be overthrown now. Not now, brothers and sisters, we are too close.